So Glen Lake is just to the southeast of it a little bit. Um, and the uh, building, or the buildings you can kind of see it in this aerial photograph on the right, which is for a redevelopment map for the city of Minnetonka. There's been to do some things around there. So you kind of see the area. Here's a photo of Glen Lake in the winter of 1981 and in the early summer today. Glen Lake has never really been a town. It's been a community. And at one time, some residents wanted to incorporate it back in the 1950s. But it was decided after much discussion and some angry feelings that it would be better to stay within the Minnetonka Township government. So uh, Minnetonka became a village in 1956 and then became a city in 1968. Um, the, the four sections here, you can see 27, 28, 33, and 34. So they, Kind of decided that um, that Glen Lake should include the four square miles that are one you know, that are centered on that intersection. So that's the, the lines that are going around, encompassing Glen Lake on the bottom right. And so, how did it get its name? Um, notice the dashed outline down here of the Robert Glen property. So, uh, Mary and Robert Glenn built a clean shanty cabin, clean it's called a shanty, near the southwest shore of today's Glen Lake sometime before April 2nd, 1857, when President James Buchanan signed the original land grant for 160 acres under the preemption act of 1830. So here's what it might have looked like in this painting uh, and another recent find uh, was this 1857 Illustrated newspaper, Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. Really great artwork of, uh, you can see the, she's greeting her husband who's just caught something in the trap and, or, or shot it or whatever, bringing home supper. And uh, there's a ox cart with big wagon wheels next to it. And uh, in the early days of settlement in the Glen Lake area, it took four hours with a team, an ox team in one of those wagons and heavy load to drive to Minneapolis, or an hour and a half with a fast team of horses at Buckport. The area was covered with oak and elm and brush. There were timber wolves, coyotes, and deer the roads were narrow and muddy. Back then, you just had to keep occupying your cabin or your claim shanty until the surveyors came around after 1854. Um, if you if you left even for a short time, someone else could jump your claim and had to hold it by force. So this is kind of this nomads or this, this uh, kind of limbo time before 1858 when we became a state when the treaty to traverse, traverse Sioux happened and we took all the land from the Dakota Native Americans. But uh, so in those few years here, these clam shanties had some incidents and Dana Ferrer has a great little, little story that um, it often led to Many violent standoffs before the legal system was established in the area, like one described in this manuscript. You may have heard me uh, read this excerpt. I, I gave a presentation on Dane Ferrer's manuscript two months ago, and I talked about how this local man was defending his shanty when he came home and he found that there were three men who had taken it, and they were like, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, so he waited until they were gone and they had gone to the other side of the property. He went under his floorboards and found his gun and an empty bottle of whiskey, an empty bottle. So what's funny about the story is he came up and he pretended like he was drunk. So he put water in it. 
And you get up and get up one way, swing the other up. And they ran off. And so that worked for a while. They went back to Minneapolis to get their own guns, which took many, many hours the rest of the day. And they also got some whiskey, though. And they started on the way back. One of them was so drunk, he shot himself in the arm. <laughs> and they said, and so they had the guns to start. He said, that was the end of the the claim jump on the ash anti. So they just went back and ran for it. <laughs> but I mean, I love these stories. It's so great to get um, to get this book published finally after 60 years trying to get it done. So um, Minnesota became a state in 1858, and like I said, and the first survey of Minnetonka Township was completed in 1855, and today's Glen Lake. Is, is looks like it's way outside of there in this first map. They, um, so they had it wrong actually, but you know they're doing their best. And they described it at Glen Lake property as hilly with old and hazel trees. This 160 acres changed hands several times. The Glen sold it in 1858 for $400. In 1908, the property was sold to Hennepin County, and the county then built the Hennepin County Glen Lake Sanitarium, which I'll talk about quite a bit at the end, um, and the home school for boys there. Of course, now, what is it? A golf course. <laughs> so that was the, uh, their property. And you can see it here. Here's Glen Lake looking southwest. Here's the golf course, which was Glen Lake Sand, just sitting there, and the home school for boys with the riding track. And so they had all this 160 acres, and the intersections over here that, that got named after. So in this map, uh, the purple lines show the different sections. So this is kind of a closer look at, at how. Uh, these are sections 27, 28, 33, and 34, but they have a lake way over here. This is a 1907 map, and from then until now, we know that it's in this section 34, much closer to the intersection of Eden Prairie Road and Excelsior Boulevard and the train track coming from Minneapolis going out west. So let's talk about, so we'll be talking about some of the families that. Um, um, had their businesses around Glen Lake. The early settlers were primarily farmers who came in the 1860s until 1900, mostly from the Bohemian section of Czechoslovakia. The present street names reflect this heritage, like Dvorak, Chastik, Kroll, and Kinzel. This, Frank, this is Frank Kinzel in 1873 with his wife, uh, he immigrated from Bohemia at the age of 12, and by 1879, he owned 48 acres on the north end of Glen Lake. Um, on this later map, it just shows uh, that he, he sold some of these pieces, but he at one time had all of this, the north and east side of, of uh, Glen Lake. His, uh, Kensal Park also is there today on the north end to kind of commemorate that. It's a beautiful little park with trails and boardwalk and picnic area that you've ever been. And here are the Kensals. He and his wife Annie raised five children seeing her gathered around their front porch uh, around the 1880s. He built this sturdy brick house which stood there until the 1980s. So at one time it was this house, here it is in 79, was the longest um, standing building um, in Glen Lake. And it helped building this brick house that he owned two brick factories. Kinsella had one on Iowa 7 and Shady Oak Road, and uh, he had the other one on the uh, St. Louis Railroad track. And was used to build many of the homes in Hopkins and Minnetonka. But it didn't help that two of his partners absconded with all of the money. So they took off with all his earnings at one time, and so they had to rebuild, but he still had the other one. 
Anyway, the Kensels had a herd of Osteen's cattle, and Mrs. Kensel made butter stored in the spring house near the lake where it would stay cool. When she had enough butter, she would take it by horse and buggy to Hopkins to sell. And so there's the house, and this is the view that they had of Glen Lake looking south. And this was south. This is a great new map that we discovered, um, showing the roads from Minneapolis to Excelsior, and the tracks along with it were called uh, the Minneapolis Lindale and Lake Minnetonka Railway, going through Glen Lake and over Purgatory Creek. So here's Glen Lake right here, and this track went all the way from Minneapolis about here through St. Louis Park and Hopkins. And then it had stops here in Purgatory, out to Excelsior. Um, Dave Fur says Excelsior Boulevard was originally the Native American Trail. For many years, it was called the Excelsior Minneapolis Road. It was intended to be part of a government road between Fort Snelling and Fort Ridgely, a Western Minnesota military post, and it was heavily traveled by uh, soldiers and Native Americans. It was later part of the Yellowstone Trail, a road important in transcontinental automobile travel. So a lot of traffic going through here to go along the south side of Lake Minnetonka. And I love this map. I haven't seen it before. I started reading up here. Uh, we're standing, we're right about here now in Minnetonka Mills. It's right here where the Burwell House is. And this this little caption here says uh, Wagon Road in Minnetonka Mills. So it goes from the Hotel St. Louis, which was in Deep Haven, a uh, big hotel at the time, and then it connected with the uh, railroad here, and they could take the train into Minneapolis. Uh, but down here for Glen Lake, this is Glen Lake. This one also says uh, Wagon Road to Minneapolis. And in those days, this is 1881, that would mean you either had a red river cart, as shown here above, with huge wheels of mud all over them, see there, carry, uh, which was hauled by your ox or your, or your cows. And that would take many, many hours to go into town, or else you could have a fast uh, team of horses in the buckboard, that's called a buckboard there. So this is the intersection here of Excelsior Boulevard and Eat Prairie Road, which are highways three and highways four, respectively. And it shows to the north south Willis North South Williston Road, also known as the roller coaster road. Over here you might some of you might up and down there, it's way quite a, quite a roller coaster for all its hills that follow the property lines. And then Beacon Hill Road is the next north south road here. It was named for an airplane beacon that once was located on Highway 7, which alerted early aviators until the end of World War II. And then Wood Hill Road was called School Road at, the at one time over here. Uh, because Glen Lake School was on it. We'll talk about that later. And on the southwest corner of the roads, you can see this building labeled Kramer. So we're going to talk a bit about the Kramers now because for our 2013 presentation, we got quite a few pictures from John Kramer, who was, they were in the process of moving across the street after they had had a hundred year celebration of being the oldest business in Manitonka for 100 years. And so um, Chris and Rose Kramer, born in Germany, moved to Minneapolis in 1902 and worked at the Washburn Crosby Flower Mill, now General Mills. They moved to Glen Lake in 1907 to, to a property overlooking Glen Lake, where the first of their eight children, Margaret, was born in a tent. Um, 
After selling eggs door to door for a while on Lowry Hill in Minneapolis, Chris opened the Kramer store in 1909 on the southwest corner of the crossroads in Glen Lake, where Unnap Brewery is today. Their daughters intermarried with the other local store owners, the Kokeshes, so Margaret Harry and William Kokesh worked at Kramer's store, and her sister Rose married Frank Kokesh and worked at their Harbor store in the mountains. This is a great photo of Chris Kramer's uncle George, Wilhelm Kramer, around the time the pictures in downtown Minneapolis, 1915. He's German, so I'm not sure what he's hauling, but what do you think? It's a gigantic keg of beer. <laughs> That's a big keg. And so, but here's uh, the earliest photo of the, uh, in, the, in the 1930s of the Kramer store. And you're looking uh, southwest, so that would be the front of a map. Un unmapped brewery today, and then you know the uh, supermarkets there, the businesses there. So uh, they started with a one-room store, shown here, and later added other rooms and a meat section. A gas pump and filling station were constructed also in 1927. Business boomed in the 1920s. The streetcar flat cars kept busy delivering goods from Minneapolis to the back of the store. Um, before this store opened, farmers in the area had to travel to Hopkins or Excelsior to make their purchases, so it was pretty popular to be so um, convenient. They sold food, uh, hardware, farm equipment, animal feed, sewing materials, and clothing. Also in the barn out back were bales of straw and hay. Flour was sold in 100 pound sacks, as was grain, or bran, excuse me, bran, oats, and seed corn for the farmer's animals. Many farm wife picked out their grain by the print of the sack, interestingly, and later turned that material into a new dress or blouse for herself. Those were the days. So here's the store in the 1930s, looking west and its location on the map from your Kramer's store. Um, a screened-in porch was attached to it with an ice cream parlor with a marble soda fountain counter, and they sold Steel de Soda brand ice cream, Steel de Soda, to happy customers of all ages who sat under a ceiling fan on hot summer days eating their ice cream. They stored ice blocks in their ice house for locals, ice boxes. The Kramers had eight surviving children and all living in the family apartment upstairs of the store. All this up here. Imagine eight kids and you're running the store too. Busy, busy. Rose and the children cooked in their restaurant that they opened in 1933. The smell of freshly ground coffee wafted through the store in the morning as they ground the beans by hand. They had two six-foot-high, bright red coffee mills with large handles to grind it. They sold the coffee in one pound or five pound bags for 19 cents a pound. And they sold lots of cookies like vanilla fig, Newtons, drip ginger snaps, and washboard peanut butter cookies by the dozen displayed in large cardboard cartons. In the 1930s, butter was 19 cents a pound and was delivered to the store in Crocs. And wheels of cheese were cut in one or two pound wedges. Prunes and raisins were in 10 pound boxes cut open with a knife and sold by the pound. The vinegar and molasses were dispensed with wooden spigots attached to wooden barrels. And sauerkraut and pickles and salt brine were packed in wooden barrels, <coughs> wooden barrels too. Hamburger was 10 cents, but liver was free. <laughs> Nobody wants the liver. And here's a great picture of Chris Kramer in his feed truck in 1935 with his sons Fritz and Carl. During the 30s and 40s, Glen Lake 
there were just two grocery stores, a couple filling stations, a post office, a garage, and a barber shop. All the children worked long hours at the store. They recalled when friends would come over to ask them to play, and their father would tell them sternly to get back to work. But Chris Kramer was patient with his customers' credit in Glen Lake during the Depression especially. Many had difficulty paying their monthly bills with him, and they would have gone hungry if they had to pay on time. So he was a good man. Here is the interior of the Kramer store on the right in 1946, and on the left with John Kramer and John Kokesh in this photo in 1952. No shopping carts in those days. The customers told Chris Kramer their orders, and he or his children fetched the items. Some people left their orders in the morning and picked them up after work in Minneapolis. A standard gas station was added next to the hardware store. Here it is in 1948. Guess how much gas was it? 25 cents. <clears throat> 25 cents a gallon. Uh, notice the signs over the two doors. These, you can't quite see, this is washing. Over here, get car wash and greasing. It's a real tangible. Washing and greasing. Here are some classic 1950s automobiles parked out front too. I love this shiny convertible, Oldsmobile. And here's the grammars from the air in the, a news article in 1950. This building here, you can see, this is Excelsior Boulevard. That's in Prairie Road. And signs here say bargains galore. Kramer since 1909. Chris passed in his 80s uh, when he was eight years old in the early 1950s and rose soon after. The general store concept was outdated by 1957 and the Glen Lake Shopping Center was built on the south end of of uh, Excelsior Boulevard. Excuse me, here's the aerial view looking south. And you can see where they moved from. So originally the Kramers were here, then from uh, 58 until 2013 when we gave that presentation, he was moving from here back over to the original spot. And so he moved three times. But then just a few years later, he sold it in 2017 to the unmapped brewery. And here's the Dairy Queen across the street until uh, recently. So here's the unmapped brewery uh, since 2017. And uh, two years ago, we held a Minnetonka trivia contest there. And uh, we hope to do it again maybe this spring, depending on the situation. And, and anyway, we'd love you to join us there with your expertise on Minnetonka Tribune. And another landmark in Glen Lake, of course, was the Dairy Queen, which was built in 1968. Uh, and here it is in 1981, the upper left. I didn't have any pictures of it. 1981 here, and 2013 here. And Today now it's the Copper Hen, opened two years ago, the restaurant. Back in 1981, when they were doing the pamphlet on Glen Lake, uh, they took some photos. And these are just some of them in black and white. When you're coming over the hill going east on Excelsior Boulevard, you see, it's kind of hard to see, but this is the bank here, and the spur station on the corner, which is now the mobile station where you would take a right to go to the Dairy Queen. And here it is closer, you take a right to go to the Dairy Queen, here's the spur. And then you get a little closer and you can see the school, which we'll talk about in a little bit too, the Glen Lake School down the hill on the left, that's the community center now. And if you look to the right, you'll see Matt's, Matt's uh, auto service. And maybe you want some, uh, 25 pound dog food, dog chunks for $3.99. It's more like $40 now. Or a pumpkin for 25 cents back in 1981. But 
But now, uh, let's go back again to the early days of trains and trolleys and talk a little more about that. Um, this is the streetcar line going behind Cranmer's Hardware in the 1930s. So this is Excelsior Boulevard, and, and behind it would go the trolley all the way to Excelsior. And at the time, electric streetcars and freight trains traveled between Minneapolis and Lake Minnetonka on train tracks that were originally installed in the 1800s. As you can see from the steam engine streetcar map uh, around 1890, showing the Glen Lake Station in the way bottom right set. Uh, right here is the Glen Lake Station. Then it would stop at Purgatory for Purgatory Creek and Vine Hill, Christmas Lake, and Excelsior. And then they would hop on the, the boat and go to Big Island. In the dark here was the uh, amusement park, of course, or out to Birch Bluff. The line headed uh, for, let's see. Yeah. So that's a great map. In 1881, the Minneapolis Lindale and Mentaco Railway built an extension from Lake Harriet to Excelsior, and the two daily trains went through Grand Lake, Lake uh, during the winter. Two daily trains during winter and six in the summer months, with the running time of 80 minutes one way. The round trip fare was 75 cents. The cars were painted bright yellow and red, as you can see here on the right. By 1907, the Twin City Rapid Transit Company installed electric streetcars on the line between Minneapolis and Excelsior. And on holidays, there were often five cars running through Glen Lake on each run. The streetcars also had double deck cars for the summer and flatbed cars which hauled goods and merchants slip to the Kramers. Um, in 1913, the 12 miles to 6th Street in Minneapolis took 36 minutes by electricity. So that's twice as fast with the electric than the steam power. Uh, and wouldn't that be great to have that? Today? Of course, they're building the light rail. It's not going to go through Glen Lake, but it'll take a turn at, uh, you know, in Excel, uh, Shady Oak Road and Excelsior Board. Question, yes? I, I wrote I wrote yourselves here. And that um, trolley, uh -huh. they're still running um, just west of the main street of Excelsior. That's right. And, and yeah, and uh, um, Steamboat Minnehaha there. I worked on that for 2012. And they're looking for a spot for a good dock because the guy who owned the dock where they are. Where the big side was, yeah, he bought that about five years ago. What? The gentleman who, who bought that property was no longer, isn't allowing them to, to use that dock anymore, unfortunately. But they are raising money, and hopefully in the next couple of years, I hear that uh, Minnehaha will be running again across Excelsior Bay and around Big Island. Is that, there's still, it's a lot of, it's millions of dollars uh, to do it, so they're, they're working on that. It's whenever you ask them, they just, it's, we don't know yet. Uh, but it was unfortunate. But yes, you do point out that there's two places you can ride. One is in Excelsior, goes just a few blocks. The Historical Society keeps that going. And then uh, in Lake Harriet, there's some, I grew up on Lake Harriet, and that, goes a couple of blocks there for the tourists around the bandstand. So it's fun to, to get that experience. They probably will decorate the trolley for Christmas and Yeah, they probably will. And so, uh, and then this is uh, the best photograph of one that's similar to it. It's uh, actually the Deep Haven one. But uh, Glen Lake became the hub for a trading center for farmers who took produce to Minneapolis and for workers who committed to Minneapolis and hopkins to their jobs, some of which were sent to Glen Lake Cemetery. And uh, here's a couple of tickets to And this, uh, there was a bridge for the tracks uh, so that Eden Prairie Road could connect to Excelsior. And okay, so it went over the tracks there. These boys are sitting in front of 
lovely uh, bridge. It's one of the few photographs we have back in the 1920s. <coughs> and uh, there was a depot there used by commuters, farmers taking goods to the mountains and uh, Glen Lake Sanitarium workers. <coughs> the bridge with its metal railings had a rather steep incline, though, and was difficult to drive over in bad weather. One local said, you would drive over the bridge, over the streetcar tracks, and there would be a very steep hill on the north side. Mother would be afraid of sliding down. No fences on either side. Sometimes they slid completely around in Dad's Model T Ford. <laughs> Did you imagine just going sideways and there's no car? Help! So, but that ended in 1932 when buses became the primary mode. And that's when they put the Minnehaha boat and some of the others sank it to the bottom of Lake Minnetonka. And it was brought up in the 1990s. But the, um, it's too bad we don't have those still today. Here is the crossroads of County Road Street 4 in, in a photograph uh, showing in, in 1964 here. And then uh, I wanted to point out this great resource called MAPO, um, which is aerial photographs of any place in Minnesota, starting in the 1920s with airplanes that would go over and take photographs. And they're all available. They're high resolution, so you can really zoom in on your house and whatever you want to see. And so it, it's kind of fun to look at this intersection here. In 1937, you see Kramer's Hardware here, and we're going to look at this store too, the Sandberg store. And um, in 1947, right after World War II, and here's in 1957, they're starting to excavate this big hill on the other side here to make way for it's flat now for all the businesses there, the bank and the post office. And then 1964, you can see the Dairy Queen, well, actually not until 68, uh, it was just going to be in that building. There's the Dairy Queen now, 18, 1971. And so, but looking even closer with that, um, Aerial photograph, you see this uh, outlying property, the biggest property around here, is still intact. And, uh, in 2013, we had Ann Mill Mall, M A L M Hostel is her name. Uh, her family lived, has lived there since 1922, and um, it's still intact today. This is a look up at it. This farm here with Eden Prairie Road, Kramer's Hardware, and uh, Excelsior Boulevard, and this is uh, uh, Williston coming up that way. So here are the Wong Hospitals, and they, uh, uh, this picture is of Anne's grandparents' wedding around 1900. There's Edward Clifford Wong. And Annette Quam Mom, they're called Eddie and Eddie. And in 1924, actually, they bought this big property southwest of the crossroads with a white farmhouse. It's still there if you drive by. It's actually on Glendale Road, just the south side of it. And he was a chiropractor who wanted a hobby farm since he grew up on a farm. And he also wanted their, they wanted their children to commute to the University of Minnesota along the electric trolley car tracks next door. But of great interest to us is the log cabin here in their yard that we think is the oldest structure in Minnetonka still standing. This very old building was used as a log barn for cows. As far as Ann knows, the log building was always a barn. There were stalls in there. And that's where we kept our cows, she says. It possibly could have been built as long ago as the 1850s, but we're not sure. Um, she is the granddaughter of the moms who bought it, and she looked for records to see if she could get a date for it. Um, it goes back to 1870, Joseph Tridel purchased 31 acres on that corner of the same spot. And also Thomas Lowry owned it for a number of years.
years. He was uh, famous for the Minneapolis Parks for starting that. Um, however, she wasn't able to trace the original land grant. Couldn't find anything earlier than that. So you can only suppose that it was has been there perhaps since the Homestead Act in the 1850s. Um, but we'd like to get an expert to analyze it, kind of like the Trapper's Cabin in uh, Wyzetta, where they, they were able to date that back to the 70s, I think. It's in Wyzetta Park now. They moved it. Uh, there's a whole book about it. But anyway, here she is, her mother, on top of, of the cabin, or the uh, barn, in the uh, 1920s. And here is their original chicken coop at uh, 14516 Glendale in the 1920s. Mom told me that when she was growing up, they sold surplus eggs and milk to Sandberg Grocery, where the mobile gas station is today. And they sold raspberries at the crossroads out back of their Model T truck. Here's what it looks like today. If you drive down Glendale, you can see the log cabin there in their farmhouse. And all this land way to the left is theirs. Here it is in the 1930s, Kramer Hardware in white right there looking in the same direction. And so all of that is here. And, uh, Kramer's, and now we're going to talk about the Sandberg Grocery on the other side, which has quite a bit, we found quite a bit of information about. In 1921, a grocery store was built on the southwest corner of the crop, or southeast corner of the Crossroads, and after changing hands several times, it was bought by Carl Sandberg, a grocer, for $1,300 for the stock and $1,400 for the fixtures. Now you, can, you couldn't even buy a cash register for that, she said as they were in the oral history. Carl soon met Francis, a nurse, and they got married. Here's their store in 1933. They had two sons, Carl and Earl, in the late 1930s, here with their dog, Buddy. It's said that during the gas rationing of the 1940s, traffic through Glen Lake was so light that, a, that Sandberg's dog, Buddy, seen here, would often sleep in the middle of the road, undisturbed for hours, as the gas rationing nobody could drive. But that was quite the store. Um, uh, for a few years, they had a restaurant in the building, and it also housed the uh, Lawrence Laundry. And Carl Sandberg became the postmaster when he bought it. So this all made their store the center of activity in the 1930s and 40s. People waited for the bus, picked up their mail and small children, and returned pop bottles for a refund. Much of the traffic was coming and going from Glen Lake, Santa Here is one of the only photos of the intersection in the 1930s. It's looking east from the middle of the crossroads with Glen Lake School on the left, right over here, and Sandberg grocery store here. So did that compete with Kramer's then? Yeah, it did, but they're really uh, friendly and it's, uh, they tried to kind of be symbiotic in that Kramer's uh, tended to do more harder and serve the farmers more with feed and things coming off the train track you know, and big, big orders, whereas uh, Sanders was, you know, did the mail, the restaurant. Yeah, everybody was friendly, you know, businesses. Um, but the business was actually going very well for the Sanders, totaling about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year gross, gross, until the night of February 13, nineteen forty-six. That night, Carl smelled smoke in the basement as he was adding up the receipts and tried to put out the fire with the garden hose, but it flashed across cartons of matches in the basement and quickly went out of control. He rushed upstairs and rescued Francis and the children. The volunteer firemen from Hopkins and Excelsior were unable to save the building. They lost everything except for the dining room dishes 
and the post office boxes, even $1,500 in cash receipts from that day. The Sandbergs built a new grocery store with the insurance across the street on Beacon Hill and Excelsior Boulevard, which was torn down for the present day park. They bought this house here afterwards, so they lived where the community center and the baseball fields are now. And here's Carl and Francis Sandberg giving this interview in 1979 or so. And here's some of the Sandberg store employees uh, posing for this photo in the 1930s, including Maxine Kuchera. Right here, and this must be her daughter, because all we know is this is Ruth Kuchera next to the hill, which was removed in the late 1950s on the left. And it's the same view as that other girl of Sandberg Grocery. They're probably friends and took turns taking a picture. But, you know, 1930s kind of looked like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz at that time. If anyone knows the Sandbergs, uh, perhaps, does anybody here know the Sandbergs? Okay. Well, wonderful. Uh, these photographs are a little fuzzy because we had to scan them from the pamphlet. We don't have the original photographs. And uh, we'd love to just scan them and give them right back to you sometime uh, so that they're clearer and we can see more details. Um, yeah, see all these the uh, lady up on the top right. Top right is my aunt. Oh, what's her name again? Um, Evelyn. Shower. Evelyn Shower. Yeah. What was it? Shower. That's not yet. Yeah. Well, we yeah. If there's any mistakes, we'd love to fix them too. So please, uh, if you can contact us through the website or whatever, send us an email. We'd love to. We, we want to keep this going um, to get everything right and add new pictures. Um, this seems out of place, but uh, it, it's from a story that Shorty Stewart, remember, he's one of those who wrote a pamphlet. And uh, he has this uh, mystery that he wanted to see if anybody could figure out. Um, and while he was attending Glen Lake School, the excavation began to widen Wood Hill Road. The children of the school watched this, and during the process, a skeleton was unearthed. It was atop the hill at the corner of the playground back of the school, close to Tree Street. There had been a legend that when Chief Red Rock died, he was buried in the prairie near Island Lake. And then later, his remains were moved to a, quote, a hill at the north end of Glen Lake, overlooking the lake. This was the old hill. Uh, according to Shorty Stewart, an anthropologist from the University of Minnesota came, examined the remains, and took them with him. But then nothing has ever heard about the results of that examination. And so, uh, you know, you heard of that mystery? No? Okay. Anyway, this is a famous picture of Brad Cloud, who's got many pictures. There's no pictures of Red Rock, but he, we think he may be one of these uh, chiefs or graves in picture. But anyway, kind of interesting. And so uh, here's the post office after the hill was removed in the 1950s. Other buildings were constructed on the north side of Excelsior Boulevard, including the Minnetonka Bank and the Minnetonka Post Office. Back in 1855, Glen Lake had one of the earliest post offices in and a county west of the Mississippi River, including uh, and, and actually Charles Burwell of the Burwell House, that house was built in 1883, and he uh, was the postmaster for 17 years, um, while he also owned a mill there. The Glen Lake Post Office was established in 1922 at the sanitarium. And the post office department felt that one post office at the cemetery would serve the entire Glen Lake area. But interestingly, the people protested that children couldn't enter the tuberculosis treatment facility because of TB, of course, uh, and it was moved to the Glen Lake Commercial Corner. There, Carl Sandberg in this photograph, oops, uh, here, 
is with his grandson, um, and he was the postmaster there for many years. This picture is 1934. So, do you know that grandson? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, great. And his uh, wife, Frances, worked as the postal clerk for many years here at 79 cents an hour. 79 cents. In 1963, it became the Minnetonka Post Office, and the new building was built at the crossroads. So the Kokeshes had a big family around Glen Lake. They intermarried with the Kramers. Here is Chris Kramer on the right and the Kokesh. Uh, family reunion. Are there any cool questions here? So there usually are some. Yeah, hi. Uh, and we've done some things about their family before. Here's their hardware, which wasn't in Glen Lake, it was in, uh, on 9th Street and Main Street in Hopkins. And and here's Louie and Charles Kokesh in their fruit and vegetable market on Excelsior Boulevard in 1927. And later in the 40s. But they also had an interesting business that is obsolete now that served all the people of Glen Lake with an important resource in the summertime. Does anybody know what that would be? Ice. Ice, you yeah. know. Yep. So Glen Lake provided ice for homes in the area before gas and electric refrigeration was available. And Rudy Kokesh started an ice business in 1929. And uh, Louis Kokesh, Phil Kokesh, Walter Huber, and Fritz Kramer were his helpers as they cut ice for a couple of weeks, depending upon the weather. They don't have a picture of them, doing it, but this is a little earlier, but you get the idea. It's probably pretty dangerous if you fall in. And what they did was hook up a Model T engine Furnish, furnishing power for the saw that cut pieces of ice 18 inches wide and thick with a length of two or three feet. The ice was floated through a channel to a loading platform where it was lifted onto trucks and taken to a sawdust storage facility like the one next to Kramer's Harbor. So, I got that thing going. So, a little bit about the schools, the original one room, Glen Lake School called Jackson School was for the nearby farmer, was northeast of Glen Lake on Excelsior Boulevard and Woodbridge. Later, a new school was built closer to the crossroads, just east of Whitlow Road on Excelsior Boulevard, where the community center is now. The first two rooms of the old Glen Lake School were built in 1912, and then they added two more classrooms in the gymnasium later. And uh, this is a view from the back playground looking south. And here are some of the students today on the left. Um, after World War II ended, the four classrooms were bulging with children, so in 1946 it consolidated with the Hopkins School District. And the junior and senior high school students were bused to Hopkins. Here are some of them in the 1940s, including our longtime uh, board member Phyllis Mattel on the right. In the last presentation, she helped. Um, in the 1940s, there was, it was used for basketball games between Minnetonka Mills and Old Mall, and it was a dance floor on Friday nights with a jukebox playing big bands, shottishes, polkas, and this, the butterfly dance, the Czechoslovakian butterfly dance. During that, the old uh, Glen Lake School. Uh, is seen in this 1981 photo in the distance here. You can see there is now the community center on the right. So uh, today is baseball fields, and you can see it in relation to lines and byways, the Glen, uh, the Bank, and the Gold Nugget. Um, so that was all done in 1990. And here's uh, Glen Lake Elementary School shown on the left, built on Woodbridge Road in the 1950s. And the other school is Gatewood uh, on Eat Prairie Road across from the golf course. And then uh, 
little look at the churches. There are three churches in the area. The first was Federated Church in 1915 with 11 denominations represented in its membership. The Presbyterian Church was established and built um, in a building on Beacon Hill Road in 1922. And here are these pictures, the Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Church and School dedicated its church building in 1946, right after the war, in a Quonset hut next door to the Glen Lake School. Here are the parishioners outside the Quonset hut. This picture is on their website. You can see how it's just kind of a temporary building before the building. In the 1950s, it was moved to the corner of Mayview Road, right by 494. And I have five minutes left to so finish with the Glen Lake Sanitarium, which was opened in January 1960 as the Hennepin County Tuberculosis Treatment Hospital. It initially had a capacity of 50 patients, and it grew to 500 beds, with additional buildings being constructed during the 1920s. It was one of the three leading tuberculosis treatment centers in the world. At the height of the 1930s tuberculosis epidemic, 715 people lived at the sanitarium, receiving the best medical treatment available. After World War II, right here you can see where it was with Glen Lake in Prairie Road, now the golf course was the, the buildings were already around here at the hill. And then this is the home school, and the kind of home school. After World War II, other services began operation here. The Country Boys Home, the elderly patients formerly in states, hospitals, building, and the school for retarded youngsters. The sanitarium bought numerous changes in Glen Lake community. Better roads were necessary for the doctors that came in from Minneapolis. And families moved to the area who worked there, creating a need for more retail and shops and things. Here is uh, the Glen Sand under construction in 1916. See, there's still building over here. It's horse-drawn wagons, you know, hauling and then a steam-powered shovel here back in 1916. Uh, realizing that tuberculosis was not just afflicting adults, they constructed a 60-bed hospital for children in 1922. The young patients had school lessons, played outdoors, and cared for pets. Because they really didn't have much they could do. They just kept thinking that fresh air Sunshine was the best for them, so they had to spend years away from their family and places quarantined off. So, a reminder of our, you know, in the past we had quarantines just like today. Um, they had a steamboat to take kids on cruises around Glen Lake here. It's kind of nice. The average length of stay, stay was about two years. Here's some kids at a similar sanitarium. There aren't any pictures inside of the kids. Um, but this handwritten note, probably from a child, says, this is a picture of the main building, she's saying right here. To the left is women, and to the right is men. There is two big buildings back of there that cannot be seen in the picture, a sanitarium for children and a nurse's home. Numbers of patients waned with the discovery of streptomycin and other antibacterial medicines in the late 40s. And so with less patients, uh, by 1962, the sanitarium was converted to the Oak Terrace nursing home, partly shown here. In 1991, after 75 years of service to 17,000 patients, it was closed. This is a Christmas tree at Oak Terrace here. And here's some of the nurses who worked at the Glen Lake Sanitary. Maybe some of the doctors here. And kids played at Glen Lake Camp that was built for them nearby. And here's some, they're all having a great time on here. And this is a 
uh, some local Minneapolis uh, baseball players before the Twins would come out and do a charity uh, ball game with them. And here's the main cabin at G Glen Lake Camp. And today there's a, a dedication there. You can see if you go there, presented by the citizens, gratefully dedicated to the memory. Has given the presentation a couple times here, and we hope to have her again. She speaks all over about her two books. She is the expert on it, and, and here's her two books, and I'm sure that answer is in there. She knows, knows everything. Um, and it's called Interrupted Lives and the Girl in Building C. Uh, so you can. Uh, back then, we were in uh, I wouldn't say the downtown of Montana because it would be in competition with the Montana Mills, which is where, because of the tree and four mills there, and that's, by the way, the first grocery store was right there where the mill was, and that's why this book is written so good and so great. Because they knew everything that was going on. And he, in his stories, he's talking about that as the center of all the activity. But that's in the 1870s and 80s. And so I suppose after the turn of the century, Glenn Lake came more into this. Maybe, especially in 1909, when uh, the Kramer Hardware was open, and all of a sudden they had a new place they could go with all, all their groceries and feed for their animals. As I said in here, that before that, 1909, when the cranes came in, but they, there wasn't much reason to go there. So, a good question, but we came in after that. You know, we said the city of Minnesota was incorporated in 58. Uh, 56, and, and not a city, uh, it was a village, and I did a whole presentation on that. In 1956, it became a village, it was a big fight, whether it should be yeah. her wallet or in the time there was going to be two different. Right. Villages and uh, but then 68 is the date when it became a city yeah. proper. And I, I just find it interesting that we really don't have a downtown Minnetonka at all. We have Excelsior, we have Visetta, we have Glen Lake, and there's not one central. So the vision of the city back then wasn't very all encompassing. No, it wasn't. Maybe there was a little competition for There was competition, and the part I thought, looking at those maps, now this one here, is that the road doesn't go straight through. If it had gone straight through and connected Wood Hill, then that would be a busier road, but everybody has to stop, pick a left, pick a right, and on purpose, I'm sure they didn't want to change that road because it helps screen the business and, and Sanford grocery. And so it kind of became a crossroads, but it isn't a straight through. Um, and the same around the Burwell House in Minnetonka Mills, it's, it does a diagonal to get on the Plymouth Road at all. And, but uh, another point here would be that Ridgedale is by far the economic center, uh, you know, engine of Minnetonka. Now, I mean, if you look at the numbers, I'm sure it's way up there as far as the total business time in the city. So, you know, why can't that be the center of it? Well, that's why I have to decide. So, it's just never, sometimes it doesn't evolve that way. Yeah. Question, yes, sir? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm about the streetcar trail. Did, is that still uh, private property? Could it still be turned into a bike trail or something? Oh, yeah, the streetcar trail that is, has become that uh, all the way from. The Dairy Queen, Minnetonka, my wife and I take it all the way up to the Maynards and right back. Yeah, so, but that's a different one. Oh, you're saying along Excelsior Lower, and yes, they are working on it. Um, actually, they should be done with part of the bike. I, I noticed that the plans were to go from uh, 494 along the south side of Excelsior Lower up to Glen Lake, you know, to accommodate people going to the brewery as well. So it's right next to the Right attached to the boulevard now, that trail. Yeah. But would that have been the street trail? Or was that a little? I think it's off there. It's complicated with right away that moment. Yeah. Who owns what? And, uh, and so 
they tried to plan it, and I think that time it does better than almost anywhere to like, get all these great trails going. Yeah. yeah. Another plug for Betty Johnson, she's the one who started that whole thing. In the back in the 60s and 70s, she said, we should have some trails. Yeah. And so she started that. Excuse me, Lisa, yeah. I was going to say that Hopkins was really the commercial father and would have, I think, been the downtown of the city of Natanka, but then Hopkins split off uh, to their own, to their own municipality, but they're part of uh, Hopkins or the Natanka area, right? The, um, what's the first one? Territory? Yeah. Township, yeah, so it's township. Where so I think that's smaller, it so happens to be its own entity, but it was the place for commerce. Even more than Richfield, Virginia, um, because there's a huge ration company there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and there, there's a big ration company, and it's actually a country turned happens into a new town. Yeah, that's a very important point, Lisa. Uh, to point out that everything was overwhelmed by the uh, by economic power of the uh, And because they had a railroad going through there and lots of crossroads that didn't have a, you know, a, a job that you had to take. Yes, sir. Uh, Lady in the back there, I think uh, you were talking at cross purposes when she was talking about the streetcars. I believe you were mentioning the the line that went by Kramer's Hardware. And, and you can see it here. It's on Stewart Lane is where that right-of-way was. And, and it's no longer a right-of-way. It's private property throughout most of the Okay. Am I pointing to the right spot here? Uh, that Stewart Lane coming behind that old deer. And then the line would go behind Kramer's here. So that could be a great trail for bikes, but I think the right away is long gone and people get chunks of it through their private property extended. Well, thanks so much. Uh, look forward to seeing you at another presentation. Um, we'll have more historical society presentations coming up. Um, and then also I do these uh, travel presentations. Some of you may have seen them. I just finished one in Greece and I did China.